Good morning, everyone. My name is Duncan McFarlane. Uh, I'm the, the project lead of the Digital Manufacturing on a Shoestring pro Program. Uh, today's uh, webinar, we're going to produce uh, an update on this project, which has been running now for two years. The first year, we, we ran a workshop, a live workshop. Unfortunately, this year, it's a, it's a webinar-based workshop, but you'll be able to keep watching it into the future if you want. Uh, and we, we're going to just give you an update on where the project's go, been, where it's going, and where it will be uh, in a year's time. So I'm going to begin with a quick introduction. I'm going to hand over to some colleagues to give you some of the more, de more, more of the details. So firstly, by way of introduction, uh, people often ask, what's, it, what's the shoestring bit? What's it all about? Is it, how does that connect to manufacturing? Well, the truth is it really came from uh, some travel guides that I, I was using about 30 or 40 years ago, uh, traveling around Europe on a very low budget. Uh, and the, the, the phrase shoestring came from that. But you'll be glad, well, maybe not glad to know, it's not, we'd all like to be traveling at the moment, uh, but it's not really about traveling. Uh, the project's really about shoestring in the context of uh, very simple, low-cost digital solutions for SMEs, which is the focus of this whole program. Uh, so that, that's what we're really get, we're going to be talking about today. So um, tune in for our, our, our later webinar if you want to hear about our travel plans. So the Digital Manufacturing on a Shoestring program uh, is really a fulfilment of this vision. It's how do we develop digital solutions with, for which the total cost of deployment is kept low. And what you see in the picture there is lots of the sort of digital devices that we're used to seeing on a day-to-day -day basis around the home or, or, or in industrial environments. We call them off-the-shelf components. We want to make use of digital systems that already exist to build simple, uh, low-cost solutions for, for either uh, applications on the shop floor in the back office or even with the suppliers in an SME environment. And the reason for this is, you know, out the feedback we got very early on was that small organisations don't have the time to deal with the complexity of the cost of digital solutions as they were being offered. So the program itself, uh, well, we, when we gave our, did our workshop last year, we talked a lot about our, our program of di digital requirements assessment, where we spent a, a spent a huge amount of time talking to a lot, a lot of SMEs about their needs in the digital space. This year's activity in, in bold has been really around, uh, around some of the, the way we've developed solutions. So the procedure we've come up with to build these low cost uh, digital solutions that can be easily deployed within, a, within an SME environment. We've done a lot of work on prototyping and piloting uh, and simplifying that solution process as well as quite a bit of work also on engagement. The next year I'll come back to at the end is how we take this out into industrial reality. So the sort of outputs we're getting from this project, uh, which is uh, funded by the UK, uh, uh, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, and is a joint project between Cambridge and Nottingham Universities, is, is to, uh, is to build a lot of what I call the core outputs around simple requirements for SMEs uh, in terms of digital solutions, come up with a, these approaches for building solutions, combining more than one solution together, building a lot of prototypes and demonstrators to show people how it's done. And then actually the third year, the year we're just starting 2021, we're going to be looking a lot at what we call extensions, you know, ways in which we build standards or compatibility guidelines, uh, a portal for assisted or automated shoestring solutions, which you'll see a, a, an early look at today, and the foundation, a home for low-cost digital solutions for SMEs in the UK. And we're actually doing some work in other, in other domains beyond the, the basic, uh, the initial EPSRC program, but that's a story for another day. And our partner base is, uh, is significant and growing, and we're actually about to add uh, another 10 partners to this list in the next week or so. Uh, but we have, just to say, we have partners from three areas, great partners, by the way. Uh, our, on, on the left-hand side, our solution provider partners. On the right-hand side, our partners and collaborators that work with us on um, 
on, on our pilot studies and our demonstrated developments. And in the center, a core group of um, industry associations that are really helping us uh, reach out to huge numbers of SMEs that wouldn't be possible otherwise. So re really fantastic, active, dynamic um, partner and collaborator base. So a point to make here, when we're talking about low cost digital solutions, it's really important that we make a we emphasize that not every digital need a company has will fit the shoestring uh, um, type of solution. So the likely type of solutions we're talking about here today, things that aren't safety critical, uh, are probably peripheral to the core production operations. And maybe there's some, you know, ones that, you know, you just I can't get a business case together for, but you have a gut feel it's important. So below the radar justification, often simple solutions, trial solutions, things which might involve sensing and decision support and, a, and particularly just a one-off need might be all that's required. Um, and just to give you a sense of it, um, as I said, in the first year, we spent a lot of time talking to companies about their, their low cost digital needs. And we're just about, to, just in the process of launching what we call our digital catalog. And don't worry, your eyes aren't, uh, aren't uh, disappearing. You don't have to read the left-hand side there, but we've basically assembled a catalogue of 59 digital solution areas that come up time and time again when we talk to hundreds of different SMEs. And on the right-hand side, you can see some of the first outputs from our prioritisation process. And, you know, at the top there, things like real-time tracking, uh, design information integration, digital work, work instructions. So they're the sort of priority digital digital solution areas that we're focusing on. So that's digi uh, digital manufacturing on a shoestring on a, in a nutshell. Um, the, the way we build it is what we're going to talk about next. And, you know, in, very, in essence, and you're going to hear much more about this from Greek, we take these off the shelf technologies, we build them into standardized building blocks uh, that can plug and play with each other combine those into common collections of building blocks, we call them service modules, and use those service modules over and over again to build our solutions. So that's the vision for how we assemble shoestring solutions in a nutshell. And on that note, I'm going to hand over to Greg, who's going to, to take you on a slightly more deeper dive in the work we've done the last year in developing a systematic, simple process for building those solutions. Thank you, Duncan. Great. Um, so in, in this slide, you can see sort of an overview of our step-by-step -step process for how a company would go about developing a solution. Uh, hopefully there's nothing groundbreaking here. Uh, it's a simple progression from uh, a needs assessment, working out what's best for the company to do, moving into uh, developing the solution that they're looking for, uh, designing it, um, then uh, procurement installation and testing. So buying what's needed to build that solution, installing it and assembling it, testing it, making sure it works the way it's meant to, uh, training to ensure that everybody that needs to use the system and maintain the system knows how to do that, and then on to operation and maintenance in day-to-day -day, uh, use. Um, and in each of these sections, we have a series of steps. Um, I'll be going through many of these in the next couple of slides, um, just to give you sort of a, a heads up. Um, this is sort of generally in a one page, this is what we're looking at. Um, so starting off with the needs assessment, um, there are four main stages to this needs assessment. We start with shortlisting. Uh, so as Duncan mentioned, we have this catalog of 59 solutions. And the first stage in this needs assessment is uh, helping companies to sort of look through this sort of list of cat uh, catalog of items and saying sort of what are maybe the five things that look sort of, you look at them and you go, actually that would be really interesting and really useful. I mean, the key takeaway here is that there's quite a lot that can be done in terms of digital manufacturing, and this can sometimes be daunting, but actually having a list in front of you helps you to maybe think of something that you hadn't thought of before. Uh, the next step is looking at solution prioritization. So that's really working out sort of what is the next best thing for me to focus on. Um, and as Duncan mentioned, sometimes in many of these cases, a lot of these things have uh, business cases that are hard to, to justify. So we do this through a set of activities that kind of go from sort of a gut feel perspective, um, because really at the end of the day, if we're achieving solutions that are as low cost as we're intending, 
the, the time and effort required to do a full business case, sort of the cost of that sometimes outweighs the actual cost of the end solution. So once we've worked out sort of this is the uh, next best solution that I'm interested in doing, we move on to uh, feature development. So we, we look at um, what features does this solution need to have? Um, and really our intention here is to sort of work out the minimal set because at the end of the day, every feature costs money. And when you're wanting something that's simple that just does what you're looking for, um, really working out what that minimal set is, is really beneficial and helpful. And once we've got a set of features, we can move on to specifications, uh, basically working out sort of the, the technical and performance criteria for the solution. And once we're through this whole process, we end up with a full solution spec for that particular solution that the company's chosen. Um, and as an aside, um, if you are interested in engaging in this process, we have a couple of slots available, so please contact us. So uh, as sort of a, an example to show how this works, um, one of the companies that we've done this with, they're a, a small manufacturer in the medical business. Um, they supply and develop visualized products to the NHS. And, and the challenge that they were faced with is that um, because they deal with these individualized products, uh, their customers sort of contact them and say, listen, I'm, I want to know sort of how long is my order going to take? Um, and because they've had a, a lot of growth in sort of the recent past, um, manual coordination of these jobs and actually tracking where things are has become increasingly difficult. Uh, so what we looked at, uh, that there were a set of benefits uh, that they were looking for in terms of improving the customer service, uh, reducing time waste, uh, and a number of features. You can see them at the bottom. I'm not going to go through all of them, um, but really just wanting to know where all the jobs are in the factory from a management perspective and from an administrative perspective, uh, being able to advise customers on the status of their orders. Um, and essentially what we're looking at developing with them is a simple system that has a barcode scanner that takes in information from the job card and outlays a dashboard that shows them where each job is and how long it's been there. So onto the solution specification and development side of things. Uh, we have three sort of general approaches uh, that can be followed in the space, uh, very much in line with our sort of overall vision and architecture. So the first step is looking at just a company comes along, they want to select something that's a ready-made solution. You sort of, you get what you get. Uh, that has the benefit of being very much a simple case. You just take it and you use it. Um, however, often it might not be everything that you need. Or on the other side, it may be way more than you need. Um, the next step down, which offers a bit more customization, is to assemble a solution from these ready-made service modules that we've spoken about. And sort of the, the lowest level is developing them from the ground up using these building blocks. And I'm going to go into all of this in the next couple of slides to hopefully explain it in a bit more detail. Uh, but for each of these, there's also a spectrum in sort of how a company does this. So all the way from uh, self-implemented, so implementing it in-house with your own in-house talent, uh, all the way on, on the left to, to third-party implementation, so essentially paying somebody else to do it. Um, and we're wanting to support this full spectrum because some companies don't have the skills to uh, do it themselves, um, whereas on the other side, companies that do have the skills to do it themselves can often achieve it at a lower cost. So on, on to this first uh, stage where we're selecting something that's a ready-made solution. Um, essentially how this would work is that for their chosen solution, the company would be presented with a set of alternatives, um, and they could sort of filter this based on their specific technical and feature set requirements. Um, and really at the end of the day, maybe there is something out there that meets the company's needs as is. Um, so as an example, um, going back to that example I mentioned earlier, um, if we're looking at job tracking uh, on, on the commercial side, uh, one thing that we presented to this client was um, uh, jobcardtracking.com. It's about 30 pounds a month, but it's a, a complete job card management system. It has a mobile app um, and it, it has a number of other features. Or on the open source side of things, uh, we'd previously developed for another pilot um, a system that did cross-site job tracking, which printed labels, uh, they could be scanned with barcodes, um, and these were all stored centrally in the cloud. So we offered, we said, well, we've got this, you can take and use it, or you can look at this commercial option. Um, and if either of those suited their needs, they could go with that. Alternatively, they could move to the, the next level of granularity and look at assembling the solution from ready-made service modules. Um, so essentially how this works is that they're presented with a set of templates. So sort of you can build the solution with this set of service modules. 
Uh, and as I mentioned, this allows uh, some customization, um, but as well as also requiring sort of a level of in-depth knowledge in terms of um, what these services can do and how they work together, but not necessarily requiring an in-depth knowledge of how they're doing what they're doing. Uh, as an example, uh, on the commercial side, this isn't necessarily on specifically barcode scanning, but it's one of our project partners. Um, they have offer a product that could be used as a data collection service module. Um, it essentially takes data from a variety of sensors and presents it on the network. Um, similarly, on the open source side, we could extract the data collection service module from that open source um, solution I mentioned earlier. Um, and pull that service module out as one of the things that they could use to develop a, a full-blown solution. Uh, and then the third option, developing using building blocks. Uh, this enables extensive customization, but it does require a significant in-depth knowledge. Um, however, we're looking at ways to at least partially automate this and make it easier for people. And my colleague Lavendra will talk about this a little bit later. Um, to, to give an example, so when we talk about building blocks, uh, you can see on the left here, a barcode scanner would be an example of a type of building block. And, and here you can see sort of three options. So in the case of our example, we're working through, uh, say for example, they were interested in uh, 1D barcodes, uh, any of these options would work for them. Um, but say for example, they needed it to communicate over Bluetooth and only the one on the left would be suitable for them. Um, once we're through this process and we've designed the solution, we then move into the last three stages. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into each of them in depth, uh, but just to give some highlights. Um, so on the procurement side, each of the solutions will have a complete bill of materials. Um, for installation, they'll be accompanied by a complete set of assembly installation and integration instructions. Uh, they'll also have a set of testing procedures so that when a company installs and integrates the solution, they can verify that it's working how it's meant to. On the training side, um, there's potential, well, there, there will be um, training videos and manuals for each of these solutions, as well as we're looking at um, doing industrial hackathons uh, with members of companies to, as, as a form of upskilling. And on the maintenance side, uh, we're looking at potential to have shoestring suppliers that offer maintenance and support com contracts for companies that are interested in that. Um, I'm now gonna hand over to my colleague, Lavendra to take you through the next section. Thanks, Greg. So yeah, Greg mentioned the ability or uh, the opportunity for users to be able to develop solutions from scratch. Uh, that requires quite a bit of skill. So we have looked at the option of uh, assisting users with uh, or semi-automating the development of solutions uh, through uh, the use of a portal. And th this comes into play at, oops, uh, I still don't have control, give me a second. Uh, that should work now. Yeah, so this comes into play at this second level, depending on how you look at it. So second from the top of this overall solution development process, which as Greg said, is split up into two, three further areas or approaches. One is to select uh, ready-made solutions from uh, and just use a solution as is, but that may provide too much or too little. Uh, and the second option is therefore to be able to tailor the solution by using what we call solution module, service modules. So you're putting together the solution, not using elementary building blocks, but, but using let's say cluster, clusters of building blocks, which we call service modules. And the third option is to put together a solution using this elementary, the most basic building blocks and be, you know, be guided in the process of doing that. Uh, so this is where the solution development portal comes in. And currently our focus is uh, to use the portal to be able to develop solutions from, from the beginnings, if you like. But we would also like to be able to use the portal to cover other aspects or other parts of the overall solution development process that was just previously discussed. So what is the portal? It's, the portal is uh, intended, intended to let users visually de design shoestring solutions using some sort of an user-friendly and intuitive uh, online uh, interface. I will show you uh, a concept video of that uh, in a couple of slides from now. That concept video is essentially what we have at the moment, but there's also a couple of improvements needed to be able to link up the portal, as I said, uh, with the rest of the overall shoestring development process. And in particular, we, uh, some of the things you'll see in the video is the ability to start or go hierarchically. You start from a solution, 
you choose the needs category that has come out of uh, come out of the requirements gathering uh, study. So you, you can say that you need a process monitoring monitoring solution. And when you choose that, you can specifically select uh, the exact type of process monitoring solution that you want. So some of these things, and when, when you selected, for example, panel data extraction, and that will become clearer a bit later, uh, you've got this black box and you can start filling in the details for that black box by choosing templates. So you choose the template that you want to be able to realize your legacy panel data extract, extraction solution. When you choose a template, that template has further components and you start going hierarchically, choosing even more templates to be able to fill out the details of those other components within the original template. So some of those details are not yet implemented, but uh, what you'll see in the upcoming video is essentially what we've got implemented. And you'll also see essentially proof of it running on, on, on a, on a, in a container-based solution at the end, end of the video. So I'm gonna play the video now and hopefully you should be able to hear the voiceover as well. When you open the Shoestring portal, you'll see a panel on the left-hand side from which you can select solutions, services, or building blocks. We'll start by selecting solutions. The solutions are grouped under different categories. Currently, we've uploaded four, but these will increase as new solutions become available. We're going to demonstrate how to deploy a solution that falls under the process monitoring category. As you can see, currently you can choose from three different types of process monitoring solution. We need the solution that relates to monitoring data from a legacy panel that's located at a small manufacturer's site. So we'll choose panel data extraction. Here's a photo of the panel from which we're going to extract the visual data using a camera and Raspberry Pi. The visual information will be digitally transcribed and published to an iPad. We've named the solution Legacy Panel Data Extraction. Each solution will need some tailoring to fit your setup. Once you've chosen your solution, you need to select a suitable solution template, which includes the requirements that you will have specified in the shoestring requirements workshop. Click on the search icon in the top right hand corner and the first solution template will appear. I don't want this template, so I'll click on the next to see the next one. This is the solution template that we'll select as it has the three service modules that we need, a data collection service, a data storage and management service, and a user interface service. You'll need to tailor each service module to fit your requirements. Let's start by developing the data collection service module. First, click on the search icon to display the available service module templates then select the suitable service module template. Here we're choosing the first template shown, which comprises four building blocks. Each of the building blocks selected will need to be specified. The data collection template we chose comprises four building blocks, a computing device, a sensor, a driver, and finally, a service wrapper, which enables this service module to communicate with other services. At this point, you can start filling in the details for each of the building blocks shown. Here, we will start with the computing device building block and select a microcomputer. Once you've completed the fields in each building block, the template becomes a finalized service module. Now we'll look at the details selected in each of the building blocks. Some of the detail within building blocks is hidden by default. For example, there is an extra hidden detail within the service wrapper building block the building block can be expanded to see the full detail. This service wrapper building block publishes data extracted from a legacy display panel. By default, all of the fine data within the service is published, but this can be manually changed if needed. The data that's published here relates to the current position of the dial, whether the red light is currently on or off, and the current temperature displayed on the panel. We've selected the software. This example shows how the solution detects whether the light is on or off. The location of each component on the panel can be drawn directly on the screen and the coordinates entered automatically into the corresponding component, which we've named red light. No name is specified for this panel component, then the default name will be given, for example, light. There are also component species corresponding to the other elements on the panel shown, such as dial and temperature. You can draw a rectangle to accurately cover the panel element. This service module provides a user interface service for data sent from the data collection service. 
Clicking on the service wrapper will show if it is subscribing to all the data that is sent from that service. The detailed message has been automatically generated, but it can be edited if needed, for example, to subscribe to a different service or to subscribe to more data or less data. In the visualization building block, a default dashboard has been added automatically for the Grafana visualization platform. Each of the detailed components for the default dashboard correspond to one element on the panel. These components can be edited if needed, for example, to change the color or the type of plot in a panel. An example of an auto-generated Grafana dashboard is shown at the bottom left. The panels on this dashboard are auto-arranged from the components within the visualization building block. However, the panels can be manually rearranged directly on Grafana. Alternatively, a different visualization template could be selected by clicking on the search icon. In order to deploy the solution, the code generated from the portal needs to be downloaded as a zip file and then installed on the relevant computing devices. A bill of materials and guidelines are also generated from the portal to facilitate buying and connecting hardware, for example, computing devices. So yeah, that's, that's an example of a solution being uh, generated as a zip file and you download the solution and then you uh, run it. Oops. Okay, so you generate the solution uh, as a zip file and then you uh, take individual components of the solution and run it wherever you want, want, want to run, run, run those bits. For example, on a laptop, on a Raspberry Pi and so on. But you can also generate some solutions and run them directly on a browser. Uh, we have another video uh, Show, showing you that this, this one didn't. Um, so moving over to the demonstrators and pilot studies. So the point of doing these demonstrators and pilot studies was partially to be able to extract building blocks and service modules from them so that we can make those building blocks and service modules available for the, for the portal or for the rest of the shoestring solution uh, development process. Another reason to do that was also to see if we can uh, uh, develop solutions faster by using the shoestring solution development process or the portal compared to doing it manually. So we were keeping logs of uh, development time when we were developing our solutions uh, using, uh, you know, doing it manually versus uh, versus developing it uh, using the portal as, as you just saw. So when we talk about demonstrators and pilots, uh, uh, we have a couple of categories talking about the various levels of uh, technology readiness, if you like. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but essentially we have demonstrators and pilots and we have demonstrators that are lab demonstrators, the very beginning of a demonstrator. It becomes an industrial demonstrator. It moves on to a company, it becomes an industrial pilot. And finally it's uh, uh, you know, in day-to-day -day use at the company. Uh, this, this can be read offline. But some of the demonstrators and pilots that we have ready at the moment are the ones that you see listed here. They meet various needs from our uh, needs catalog that you saw earlier that came out of the requirements gathering part of the shoestring process. So for example, we have some solutions for job tracking, uh, digital job cards, process monitoring, a couple of those for process monitoring, the automated delivery of parts and tools to operators, optimization of tool use and so on. And the names that we have assigned to these solutions are shown on the left. Now you saw in the portal, uh, video from before you saw a pilot that's actually being uh, becoming a pilot if you like it's running it's starting to run on one of the factories uh, for one of our SME collaborators. I will show you uh, an example of uh, the equivalent demonstrator how that started off as a demonstrator that might also give you insights into how we have used our shoestring development process to build the demonstrator version of that first and then that made its way into a pilot later. So this is this is the same uh, pilot in, in, in its initial form. So you know what the pilot was about. It was about extracting real-time data from legacy control panels uh, using a low cost vision system. So everything that we used was pretty low cost. You know, it's, uh, every, every component of that was probably about less than 50 pounds. And there were not that many components. Maybe there were, uh, maybe there were three altogether or, or yeah, probably three and not all of them were uh, 50 pounds either. Uh, and there was also a need to store historic data for later usage for various types of use, for example, for quality control, or it could be for fault detection to figure out why something went wrong 
if something did go wrong later. Um, the user study here with our, for our pilot, for our, for our SME collaborator was to be able to capture uh, tank panel status information and to map that information back into what's actually going on on the factory floor. So to associate panel, panel status information to the metal sheet process that they had uh, in their facility. The solution that we had uh, that came out of the shoestring development approach is shown on the right. You kind of you kind of already saw the building blocks earlier, but those building blocks look slightly different because those building blocks were from from the portal. So this this takes me back to being be to kind of using the portal uh, to cover the earlier stages of our, of our shoestring development approach. And these building blocks that you see here are the ones that Greg showed you, but they have a one to one correspondence with the building blocks that I showed you in the portal video. Uh, so they're not, not very different, but they just slight, look slightly different now, but then there's the need to be able to capture, you know, to be consistent and to capture the rest of the shoestring development approach uh, by the portal going forward. So, so again, this is what the demonstrator look, version of that, of that pilot looked like. You see this home set up mm -hmm. on the right, mm -hmm. and uh, you can see kind of a Raspberry Pi camera there, looking at a panel this is what the panel looks like up close uh, you can see you can see some building blocks that we didn't have before for example there's a there's an led light panel here as well that's lighting up uh, the actual panel so that you can see the information uh, more clearly especially the uh, seven segment dis display so i'll show you a video of what the home setup the demonstrator the initial version looked like and uh, if i can play the video here so you've got the panel on the left. The first, first step is to be able to crop out the background from the panel, choose the actual panel in that image. So once you've chosen the panel, the system automatically recognizes the components. You tell the system what each of these components are. For example, some of them are, some of them are temperature information. Some of them correspond to, uh, uh, let me just see, uh, power. Some of them correspond to, uh, there's a water or something, an indicator there, whether it's the switch is on or off, I guess. And as you can see, as the green light goes on and off, the red light, light goes on and off, people change uh, the, the, the details on the panel. All of those changes in the details can be shown, can be seen as changes in values here in the fourth column uh, right here. And those, th that information can also be visualized in the form of graphs and those graphs can be analyzed offline like I said, for fault detection for, or for other, other purposes, depending on the, the need, need in, the, in your specific facility. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's just an example of a demonstrator to, to show you how uh, it started as a, off as a demonstrator. Uh, it went, moved into a pilot, and we were also able to regenerate, if you like, this demonstrator using the portal, as you saw in the video from before. So that, that kind of gives you an insight of the various, various uh, stages uh, that we are evaluating uh, of the of the overall shoestring process and over to back to duncan to talk about the future of shoestring i will release control Th thanks lavindra uh so i'll just so yeah the the la so that hopefully that's given you a very quick snapshot of the process we've been through to firstly understand the type of requirements that we think small companies have for low cost digital solutions. You take me through the design process uh, and, and the way that we're seeking to make the designs as simple as possible through assisted or semi-automated uh, support for the design process and actually beyond that as well I should say that the portal will ultimately be a, a, an environment that would support all the way from needs right through to um, to implementation and maintenance uh, and you, you can you've got a sense of the, the type of uh, pilots that uh, pilots we've put together and as you know Lynn just talked about one but there are you know, probably 15 uh, that we've worked on demonstrators and pilots to date. I just want to now finish by talking about where we're going uh, in the future. Uh, and as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, the notion of something called the Shoestring Foundation was were brought up in discussions with partners, actually, even in the first year of the project, when we were talking about, you know, if, if 
if these ideas could come to fruition, what's going to happen? We don't, you know, is this, is this going to be a research project that comes and goes and uh, everyone says that was, that was a fun time? Um, uh, so, what I'm, so let me just talk a little bit about that. Uh, and I'm trying to get my... Becky, I, I don't seem able to click, so could you, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, so this foundation that I've, I'm talking about is, is it's not, it's not a, a, a big activity, uh, it, but it's, it's, it's a, meant to be, as I said earlier on, a kind of a, a one-stop shop for low cost digital solutions for SMEs in the UK. Uh, so we want it to be a place where, uh, uh, and it might be a virtual place, which is this is the year of virtual places. It, it would be a place where uh, SMEs can get advice, uh, small companies can get advice about so, and solutions to their low cost digital needs. Uh, it's where uh, solution and technology providers can understand how to support SMEs and particularly, you know, understand how their um, their their developments uh, can can fit within the shoestring infrastructure. And we're, we're doing a lot of work on that at the moment. We might come back to that in the questions actually. And then finally, we provide as a, as a starting point, a set of uh, a limited set of easy to use digital solutions of the sort that, uh, for example, the legacy panel display uh, application that we're talking about, that Lavendra talked about, just as a way of giving you a, uh, an insight into, you know, maybe getting started in the process. So the foundation, um, which it, it is being developed uh, across this year, uh, when, when it launches would be a, a support for the whole, uh, the whole life cycle from needs, requirements, design, deployment of shoestring solutions. Uh, we would provide a set of guidelines for doing it. Uh, we'll uh, provide a, some form of assisted semi-automated solutions. I think fully automated shoestring solutions are, are probably uh, a little bit of a way off, but we're um, some way down the track of providing a, a very easy kind of walk you through what method for as, as Lavinda showed a moment ago. Uh, we'll provide this starting list of basic solutions, but also of service modules, because actually with what we found is that if, if we have enough of the service modules, they're building block clusters, then it becomes really reasonably easy for organisations to put their own solutions together. There'll be a, a set of demonstrations and then a, a fun, a, a, an underpinning um, number of training modules uh, and, and educational elements that go with it. Uh, so that, it, as I say, it's very much a one-stop shop. Uh, it's, you know, it's not solving every digital need <coughs> an SME, a small company will have. It's, it's not actually setting out to solve the digital, uh, low cost digital needs of larger companies, although there may be some benefits for larger companies also through, through the foundation. So just to give you a sense of it, we're, we're kind of uh, in, in what we call the transition planning phase. Uh, so the actually, the, the, the research project is due to end early next year, but actually we've, since November, we've, act, we've been have started a formal process of transition planning. Uh, and that, that's, you know, we've been one of the benefits of actually started, we started developing uh, solutions and um, prototypes very early on to give people an idea of what it might look like. And this transition planning is, you know, starting a, a year and a half into the, the research project to work out how we move towards, a, 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 how we plan to move, move towards a foundation. We'll start uh, in the middle of this year a formal transition to foundation. So we actually start to build the infrastructure and the, uh, and the, um, the industrial base, et cetera, around the foundation in order to be able to launch in early 22. And we was, we're, we're anticipating a, a year of, um, of, of really, uh, uh, of establishing the foundation uh, to get it onto a firm footing. It will be a, uh, a self-sustaining foundation ultimately with some initial startup support. So last comment uh, before we uh, op open to questions, uh, you know, the, the type of question that we're, we're asked 
being asked quite a lot at the moment is how do partners get involved uh, and 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 pa our, our partner base is, is an open partner base I should say that so you know we're very keen to hear from anyone any new company that wants to get involved in the program uh, but you know what we're seeking for is is I say active partner involvement so uh, partners that are supporting the foundation development getting the word out speaking about shoestring events and a number of our partners are already doing that very actively for us help helping to support for, uh, identify ways in which the the pump priming funding for the foundation can be established uh, for end users um, we're still what we're still doing is is trialing the uh, the workshops that Greg mentioned very briefly the requirements workshop but also the the specification workshop for establishing the specification for an input into the solution process, supporting pilots, trialing the design process. We're going to, as we come towards the middle of the year, we're going to start doing more third party trials of the design process where another organization takes the lead for all a part of the design process. Uh, solution developers, uh, what, we're very, really keen to in, involve more and more solution developers in the process you know whether it's just critiquing improving the process identifying how technologies and products and approaches fit within the shoestring compatibility environment uh, whether it's around building blocks or services or uh, total solutions uh, and, and actually we're very keen for solution developers to say well we, I've got a piece of technology I'd like to see what it takes to make that into a, a shoestring compatible building block for example or you know, or, or do a broader development, and then in the the organ, um, industry industry trade regional bodies uh, who played a big role already, I should say, but helping to organise dissemination and, and outreach about shoestring within their far, partner base, uh, and organising events, uh, and uh, we've got you know a, a number of really active bodies that we're working with there, but uh, we're, we're we're actively working at how to make uh, a lot of the outputs we're producing bundle upable so that we could actually, with, 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 with a limited input from our end, we can provide a, a workshop or a, a primer on shoestring for a, a third party organization and their, their, their partner base. So as I just, you know, as I like said, said, new partners very welcome. Uh, easiest way to get in touch is to contact us through that email address there. Um, but digitalshoestring.net, if you just type digital shoestring, you'll, you'll find us very quickly. Um, I don't think anyone else has got a digital shoestring. I think that's because it's slightly odd concept. Um, but anyway, uh, so feel free to contact us.